Hi, I'm Pastor Paul. Welcome again back to team membership class. You should get out your notebook at this time of our team membership manual. And today we'll be turning to page number tw uh, 56, excuse me. For some, it may be a page or two different, depending on the, the book you receive, but it's on what is sin. And basically, we're going to be having a discussion today about how we're separated from God. And then how is it that we also understand salvation and sharing the gift of salvation with others? So if you turn to your notebook at this time, you see that we realize that today we're going to have a discussion about sin as really a sense of disobeying God. And sin is committed by everyone. In God's word, it reminds us that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so sin is basically this. The word in the Greek is hemarte. And hemarte or hemartia is the understanding that if you take a bow and arrow and you shoot it and you let the bow go, it still may hit the target, but it may not hit the bullseye. So the idea behind this is that there are many good things we do, but many times we fall short of the mark. We don't hit the bullseye of God's will for our life. So while we may not be killing somebody or we may not um, be doing terrible things, there's still we are sinning because we're not hitting the bullseye. We're not hitting the mark that God would have for us. So sin is making mistakes. Sometimes those um, sins, if you will, are um, sins of what we call commission, things we do to um, be away from God's will. But sometimes the sins are sins of omission. That means things that we should have done. So for example, you may be taking your kids to soccer practice and saying, well, this is you know a great family day and we're doing some good things. But the sin of omission may be the fact that you should be in worship that day and not going to soccer practice and taking your kids away from God's um, place of worship that day. So you didn't commit anything terrible, but your sin of omission was not doing what was best for you and best for your family and God's will for your life. Sins of commission, sins of omission. And we're going to talk about, and if you look at the scripture and you do your reading today, about how God hates sin. In other words, because God is just, he does not like anything that pulls us away from God. But the good news is this, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. So we're going to have a conversation around that and look at how Jesus was our atonement at one mint. In other words, Jesus connects us back with God. And because he died on the cross, our sins and the penalty that we should be receiving because we make mistakes and, and rebel against God, Jesus paid for that price, if you will, so our sins can be forgiven. We have an exercise for you to do today as well. It's on page 57, and it's just basically an empty sheet of paper. Now, some of you may have time to do it in class today, and some of you may be more reflective and say, you know, I, I can't do it today. But it's just a sheet, and this won't be turned in. Nobody else will need to look at it. It's for you. It's a journal page, if you will, to write a confession letter to God. It's to get real with yourself and real with God and say, you know what? I am a sinner. I am in need of your grace. I am in need of your forgiveness. And just whether it be an outline form saying, dear God, forgive me for this, forgive me for this, forgive me for this, or to write a full letter of, dear Heavenly Father, I know today that I am a sinner. And I know today that I have made this mistake and this mistake and just Lay it out there. That's what confession is, is being real with God. And then at the end, realizing that God, when we give him that letter, is eager to forgive us. So take some time in your small group right now to discuss some of the scriptures we have listed there and also the time to write the letter in class or after class regarding a confession letter to God. I hope your discussion on what is sin went well. And we're going to move to that next section of talking about what is salvation. So turn to that in your notebook at this time. What is salvation? Well, it's the remedy for sin. It's the reminder that our sin is forgiven. And it's how we describe basically that event or process whereby we get connected to God, our sin is forgiven, and we accept the promise that we want to spend eternity in heaven. So, Salvation is more than just a, a fire insurance. Sometimes people say, well, it's like fire insurance. Well, I'm not going to go to hell because I'm saved. Well, yeah, that's salvation. But what a narrow definition of salvation. True salvation is living your life according to God's will and having experience of heaven here on earth as well as in the future. In other words, we begin our experience of heaven now when we're saved. We begin to live out a life of fulfillment here on earth. And the kingdom of God becomes real now, not just some future pie in the sky type of experience. Well, someday I'll get to experience heaven. No, when God saves you, you begin to experience that joy right here and now. So what is faith? Faith is accepting God's salvation plan. It's a reminder that God loves us so much and has a wonderful plan for our life. And so the salvation, if you will, 
is taking that experience and, and having an understanding theologically that from this day forward, I am now going to live my life differently. And the good news is this. Think of salvation as an incredible gift. And salvation, or faith, if you will, is meant to be shared. In other words, it's not just like, well, at least I'm getting into heaven. No, it's like, wow, I've just received the greatest gift on earth, the greatest gift of eternity. But now I have this family member, or this friend, or someone else, and I know that they're going to be lost for eternity. Or I have this friend or this family member, and you know what? They're not having joy in their life like I feel right now. They're feeling stress and worry and they're, they're struggling. And I have this incredible gift that I can give them and share with them and let them know, you know what? Life doesn't have to be so difficult. When you have Christ and the community of God um, surrounding you, you can experience salvation in the kingdom of God here on earth. So we're going to talk a little bit about how do we personally experience salvation and what does that mean? And then also the joy of being able to share that with others, which we use a term called evangelism. So we'll be talking more about this. As you go through this next exercise, talk of, and look at the scriptures about how Jesus saved you, if you have been saved, and if you haven't been saved, what would it take for you to take that next step of faith, to, to walk across the bridge as we're going to talk about, and to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? We're continuing the conversation about what is sin, what is salvation, and what does it mean to be a Christian. So turn to the next section, which should have on the top should have A, B, and a diagram that looks like this. We'll start with the reading of God's Word. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. It states this. If you believe or admit, or some say declare, if you admit that with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. In other words, if we admit that we're sinners, if we believe that Jesus Christ is um, our salvation, and we confess this with our lips, in other words, we say it out loud that we are saved, then we will have that relationship with God. And the D is that we are to live that life out. We are to demonstrate it. In other words, not just to make him our, our savior, but to make him Lord of our life. And this is the basic ABCD we talk about at Crossroads Church in terms of being a Christian. To be a Christian, you admit that you are a sinner and that you need him for salvation. You believe it in your heart and in your mind, and you confess it. You're not afraid to talk about it with others or to confess it out loud, to pray it to God, but also to, to share it openly and D, to demonstrate it, as we talked about with the the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, to live a life according to God's will. Many times we'll discuss it in terms of, well, how to receive salvation. And we, we talk about the bridge. This is a great way, first, to understand it yourself, but second, to explain it to somebody else who maybe does not have a relationship with God. And so the way to do the bridge diagram is something like this, is that the God created us in His image. In other words, this is not a really good, good drawing of my image of God, but I give the idea here that, you know, even just a stick figure that we're creating God's image, humanity, us individually. And, and um, we're creating God's image, but because of sin, which we talked about already, the fact that we're separated from God. And so God is over here, but because God is pure and holy and just, he doesn't want to have sin all around him. So he's purposely, as from the time of Adam, separated us. In other words, we have that sense of God's perfect and holy, but we're not. But he has provided a plan. He's, in essence, put together what I would call a bridge. A bridge between us and God that allows us to be in relationship with him. And that bridge is because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That our sins are thus forgiven. And so all we have to do to receive this gift is to walk across the bridge. And when we walk across this bridge, we are, in essence, coming into relationship with God. And we're doing this. We're admitting that we're sinners. That we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and that our sins are forgiven and that if we confess it, we walk across that bridge. And so some of you today maybe are standing right here looking across the bridge, not sure quite yet if you want to be in a, a relationship with God, fully committed. Some of you may be standing right here and you're halfway across the bridge. You're, you're this close to receiving Jesus Christ and saying, I want to live my life for him. You are already here. You've walked across the bridge and maybe you've done the, what I call the ABC. You believe in God. In fact, you may even confess it, but you're not really demonstrating it. 
And that's kind of what we talk about in team membership class. And then John Wesley talked about this. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He talked about being mature and perfect and working in holiness and striving towards holiness. And so that's kind of why the team membership has laid out some of those things that we do to continue to grow in our relationship with God. In other words, to take the stairways to heaven, if you will. We talk about time with God with devotions and how that personal time with God allows us to grow in Christ. We talk about having been in a small group as another way that we continue to work out and demonstrate our love for God. We talk about regularly participating in worship. And so worship is another one of those stairways to heaven that draws closer to God. We, we talk about how it is that when we evangelize, we are able to share God's word with others and even more people come to know him. And we talk about especially how we use our abilities or our gifts and we begin to serve God. And all these things remind us why God is important in our life. And then lastly, we will talk about is, is money or stewardship of God's reasons, being generous people. And when we're generous with our gifts that God has given us, well, again, we feel that sense and presence of God. And so this is salvation, the beginning steps, being in a relationship with God, but then continuing to grow closer to God through the things that we do as mature disciples of Christ. So we're going to have a time now to discuss this, to kind of process this information, and for you to practice. Partly what we did is we put a blank page in there so you can literally take someone in class and lead them across the bridge to salvation. So your leader will take some time with you to continue to break in groups of two and then have you practice leading someone to Christ. And then you'll stop, rotate, and do it again. And so you get used to, if you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus, how can you walk them across the bridge? So let's take the time now to practice this and to share the story of salvation with someone else and to walk them across the bridge. The next section is actually relatively short. I think that sometimes we should spend a lot more time on this section, but it's something we kind of just take for granted. And that is salvation, of course, is personal. You know, we receive Jesus Christ, we make a decision. But really, there's no such thing as personal salvation, to be honest. All salvation is communal. In other words, we're not geared up or wired or the church was never designed to be an individual understanding of faith. Faith, when some people say, well, I can practice my faith out in my deer stand and I can worship God in nature. You can, but you don't sustain faith that way. You don't grow in your faith that way. You don't build up the body of believers. All the things it talks about in God's word, which is really only takes place in the church. So that's why the next section talks about, well, what is the church? It's a, it's a community of believers. It's a, it's a gathering. In the early days, they called it the people of the way. Later became Christians because they were Christ followers. Basically, it's the community of Christ. It's the community of God, the body of Christ, as Paul described it. And so, yes, can you have a personal relationship with Christ? Absolutely. And that's an important place to start. But the connection to the body is critical because without the body of Christ, without gathering for worship or participating in a small group, your faith begins to dwindle. And like to the parable of the sower and the, the soils, what happens is you, you, you grow up on the hard soil and you go fast, but the evil one sneaks in and, and, and with no roots, you wither away. And so we have to remember that the church is what keeps us strong in our faith so that our salvation is lived out. And so this next section I'd like you to do is look at the scriptures, kind of look at faith, talk about what is the church in connection with your personal faith and how it's a home for believers. As believers in Christ, the church represents a gathering place that's for support and for fellowship and to do worship in a way you can't do by yourself. And then if you look at the next section, I'll have a discussion about reading the Psalms. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. The next section talks about basically about people and tasks and how we're going to be continuing to have that conversation about what is the church, just as you had that discussion. And so I have listed there kind of what is the difference between people and tasks, structured and unstructured, um, because the church is one body committed to Christ, but we all have a little bit different personality. So maybe the way you'll connect with the body of Christ may be different than the way I would connect. And so looking at how God has wired you will make a little bit difference as to how you connect or participate in the body of Christ in terms of serving fellowshipping, how you participate in worship, and so forth. So just kind of look at how um, that fits in terms of your personality, and then we're going to have a discussion a little bit about um, how it is we live out our evangelism gifts.
The next section is a really important section, but you may not do it in class. You may not have enough time. So probably is it going to be a take-home assignment. But I want you to understand the importance of this assignment. It's an assessment to understand how God wired you in terms of your evangelism style. If you turn to this page, you'll see kind of an assessment. And it lists out there's a variety of styles of evangelism. Confrontational, intellectual, testimonial, interpersonal, invitational, and serving. So in other words, we know we're called through Scripture that all of us should be um, giving our testimony and sharing and evangelizing others. In other words, sharing our faith is a given. If you're a mature disciple in Christ, you are going to share your faith. Some of you have a confrontational style, and that's fantastic. You are geared up and wired in such a way that you're not afraid to approach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not afraid to maybe hand out a track or, or talk to someone at work and say, hey, you know what, I have this fantastic church and maybe you should um, come and check it out. Or I'm, I'm not afraid to have that conversation in an open way about what I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, others have, will have a lot more a sense of intellectual style. In other words, you'd like to have conversations and maybe even sometimes arguments about the things of Christ. Um, maybe you're really good at a, what's called apologetics, being able to explain how, how Jesus fits in with theology or philosophy or how it's similar to Mormonism or um, a different form of religion and be able to help them understand how it's also different and have those great intellectual conversations. Some of you have a really strong gift in testimonial. In other words, you maybe had a story of your past where you fell from grace or did some terrible things, but now you've come back to know the Lord and your life is totally different. And that story can be powerful to motivate others who are also struggling that they too can come to know the Lord and change their life. Some of you have a great interpersonal gift. My wife has this. I can just see where she goes out for coffee with people. She talks with them. And somehow through her gentleness and her love, she nurtures people into a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And the others are very invitational. In other words, they invite them to a small group or they invite them to worship or they invite them to a crossroads block party or special event. And so by bringing them in, they hear the gospel message maybe that I'm preaching or that somebody else is teaching. But that invitation gets them in the door so they can hear the gospel message. And some of you are great at serving. Some of you just love to reach out in love and acceptance in practical ways, like through the community meal program or through our food giveaway Fridays or through the other things that happen in the church where you just serve behind the scenes and in that gentle way begin to, to model the servant nature of Jesus Christ. And at some point, then have that conversation where you can tell people why you serve because you love Jesus so much and you want them to love him too. So take the survey. And then we're going to have a time to process it after you finish the survey to discuss your evangelism style and how God has uniquely made you to preach and to teach and to witness to his love.